to lean. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's fountain in the cross in the cross be my glory ever till my raptured soul shall find rest be the river near the cross O Lamb of God bring its scenes before me help me walk from day to its shadows o'er me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river near the cross I'll watch and wait hoping try Trusting ever till I reach the golden strand just beyond the river and in the cross. Till I reach that golden strand and find rest beyond the river, I'm learning to lean, learning to lean, I'm learning to on Jesus. Thank you, Brother Miller, for that. Go and take your Bibles this morning and go to the book of Ephesians, <clears throat> chapter number one today. Ephesians chapter number one. We'll begin reading at verse 13 this morning. The Bible tells us, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Father, I thank You for the Bible that You've given to us. I thank You that this book that we get to hold gives us that wonderful, precious plan of salvation. And Lord, it tells us how we can have our sins forgiven. It tells us how we can have a home in heaven. 
It tells us of the great price that was paid by your son on the cross for that salvation. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. Thank you, Lord, for telling us about that wonderful work of salvation. I pray, Lord, this morning that you would use these next few moments to help encourage us, help us to learn what you have done for us. And Lord, may we walk out of here excited, encouraged to know what a loving Father we have in heaven and what a wonderful Savior we have that has saved us. And Lord, I pray that you'd encourage us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> As we have gone through these verses here in the book of Ephesians, we have seen in the first few verses of this uh, first chapter that God the Father was involved in laying out the plan of salvation for us. And we get to verses 7 through 12, we find that in that plan, He had one who had to come and execute that plan. And so we have the Son who has provided it for us. But now in verses 13 and 14, we find that He has given one to us who will protect that which He has provided for each one of us. God has built in His protection plans for His salvation. Much like as we go about our days and we look to purchase things or we look to, uh, to do our daily business, we look for assurances and we look for protections along the way and we'll do all that we can to protect it. God has done all that is necessary to protect salvation. He has not left it up to us to hold on to it, to protect it, to keep it. Rather, He Himself is going to take care of the whole thing. And aren't we glad that we have a Savior who is involved in our salvation and a God who has looked down through time and understood the frailty of mankind and in so doing has provided a way to protect that wonderful most precious gift of salvation for us. In verse 13, we are reminded here once again of how salvation is received. Look at verse 13 again. He says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that, ye believed. We are reminded here that our works had nothing to do with our salvation. We're reminded here that it's all about faith and what God has done and believing in that wonderful message that He has given to us. Before we could receive it, we had to hear that message of the gospel. Let me ask you this morning, who is it that shared the gospel with you? Go back in time, maybe. It might be just a, a few short months or a few short years or maybe it's many, many years for you. But go back to that time, to that person who was responsible for giving you the gospel. It could have been a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was your parent. Maybe it was a friend. Maybe it was a preacher. Or maybe it was someone knocking on your door. But somebody brought the gospel to you. Yes. Romans chapter 10 and verse 14 tells us that, that no one can hear without a preacher. And the Bible tells that we need somebody to go out and proclaim the gospel so that all can hear. And so God gave us the responsibility. He gave us the great commission. He said to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It doesn't mean just that a preacher, somebody who's been ordained to the ministry is to do this. No, it's for every Christian to go out and to proclaim. That's what the word preach means. It means to proclaim uh, the gospel, the good news. What is that good news? The good news is this. Jesus has come and He has died on the cross and He has paid the penalty for your sin and now you can have your sins forgiven and you can have a relationship now with the God of heaven. That's what you were created for in the very beginning. In Genesis chapter uh, 2 and 3 we find that God walked in the cool of the evening with mankind and He had sweet fellowship with Adam and Eve. But because of sin, that sweet fellowship was broken. And God so desired to have that fellowship restored that He sent His only begotten Son into this world to restore fellowship. Yes, we get to have heaven. Yes, we get to have our sins forgiven. Yes, we get to have a home for all eternity. Yes, we get to have all these wonderful blessings. But first and foremost, the reason why God brought salvation was He wanted to have fellowship with His creation. And he's provided a way. And listen, not everybody knows about that. Not everybody knows that there's a God who loves them. Instead, they see a God who sits up in heaven and who looks to hurt them, who looks to destroy them, who looks to cause them to have a, a terrible life. And he's taken all the fun out of life. That's what many people view God as. But that's not who God is. God loved this world. 
God did all he could for this world, and he gave his only begotten son for them. Aren't you glad that somebody brought that message of salvation to you? Aren't you glad that whether you grew up in church or somebody came by and knocked on your door and they invited your family to church, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that you have salvation enough uh, this, this morning, that you have that wonderful blessing? But it's not enough for them to hear the gospel. There must be belief. Unless the sinner acts upon the message of salvation, they are not saved. They can sit in a church like this. They can sit in a Sunday school classroom. They can grow up in a good Christian family and hear the gospel all their life. But until they accept it for themselves and put their faith in that message, it does them no good. Yeah. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 still tells us that, uh, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's got to be a response to the message. And that's what Paul's talking about here in verse 13. He says, In whom ye also trusted, ye responded to the message of salvation. Notice, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. After that, ye believed. Two times Paul emphasizes the importance of belief, of trust. This morning, have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? It's not enough to just go to church. It's not enough just to know the words. It's not enough just to repeat a prayer. It's not about those things. It's about this, do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the question this morning. He says this here, for those who have chosen to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, He's done something for us. I want you to get this this morning because God has given us such a precious gift. He's done something wonderful. He's done something he didn't have to do, but he chose to do it for us anyway. Notice there at the end of verse 13, he says, Ye were sealed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. God has sealed you this morning. Now, we, we have many ways we use that term sealed, but boy, there are some wonderful things that God wants us to get a hold of uh, here this morning. First off, I want you to see this here. You were sealed at the moment of salvation. It didn't happen somewhere down the line. It didn't happen a few weeks later, a few months later, a couple years later. No, it happened at the moment of salvation. Notice he says that the moment that you believe, that you trusted, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, there's not two separate transactions that take place. Uh, sometimes uh, people uh, mistakenly uh, talk about a second feeling of the Holy Spirit. We're not getting a second feeling of the Holy Spirit. It's simply Sometimes that the Holy Spirit is getting more of you is what's happening. Uh, but it's not that we're getting more of the Holy Spirit. You understand that salvation, you received the Holy Spirit at the very moment you received Jesus Christ. Why? Because He is the seal of that promise. Uh, he is the one we have to have in order to keep that wonderful, wonderful gift of salvation for us in Acts chapter 10 verses 34 through verse 48, we are given the account of a man by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius sought the Lord. Oh, how he so wanted to know the Lord. And he had done all these wonderful things. He gave alms and he did all he could in his own strength, but he came up short. And one day God sent the apostle Peter by his way. He sent some men. He told Cornelius, he said, send some men to Peter. He will come and he'll tell you what needs to happen. Peter came reluctantly. Yeah. He didn't want to go to the Gentiles, but he went because God told him to, and so he finally obeyed. And so he walked out the door, and he, he went with those three men and arrived at the house of Cornelius. And Cornelius just isn't there by himself. No, Cornelius got every family member he'd get a hold of. He got every friend within a mile of his house, and he packed that house. And Peter came in and he goes, what is this whole uh, gathering that is here in this place today? He says, we, 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 I saw in a vision that you have the words of life. And we're here to hear what God has done. Yeah. Yeah. Preach to us. Yeah. Boy, what a, what a wonderful thing. Can you imagine coming in and having all these folks saying, we want to know the truth. Peter opened the Word of God and he began to preach. And the Bible says those folks believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the moment they believed, the Bible says immediately the Holy Spirit came upon them. Immediately they received the Holy Spirit. 
And they baptized them right away uh, after that point too. But we see there that transaction that took place of salvation, that the moment they received salvation, they also received the Holy Spirit. The, the Holy Spirit that God gives to us comes at the moment of salvation. But also this here, we were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And this is a financial transaction, if you will. That's what he's talking about here. Look at 1 <coughs> Corinthians chapter 6 with me, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, look at verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Whenever God purchased us at salvation, uh, we received salvation. He became our owner, if you will. Uh, he purchased us. And to give a sign that we have been purchased, He put a seal upon us. Uh, he, he stamped His seal in us. You say, what is that seal? It's the Holy Spirit of promise has been stamped inside of you. To say, this is mine. This belongs to me. It was a financial transaction that took place. There was a purchasing. We use the term redemption uh, there, that it, it belongs to you, uh, that it is now your own. Uh, you have put your name on the title, uh, if you will. God has put his name on the title of us. You say, well, I'm my own person. I, I belong to myself. Oh, friend, you never belong to your own self. Right. You understand that before you came to Christ, you belong to the devil. That's whose possession you were. Now the devil will let you run around and do what you wanted to. And he'd let you kill yourself if you wanted to. But uh, he owned you lock, stock, and barrel. And then Jesus came and he made the purchase price. But this is the amazing thing about this. Is we had to accept the transaction. That makes no sense. Why if I were to go down and to purchase a car today... It wouldn't be relying upon the car to say, well, I guess I'll go home with you. If I were to go out and buy some head of cattle today, it wouldn't be relying upon the cattle to say, well, I guess we'll go and we'll take your brand and, and go out into your fields. That's not how it works in our, in our world, does it? But for some reason, some reason unbeknownst to me, God said, I'll let you make the choice. I will make the payment. I will pay the price. And I'll let you choose if you'll receive my payment and you'll become mine or if you'll be content to stay with the devil. That's what he did for each one of us. Amen. And if we come to Christ, <laughs> we say, Christ, I see the sacrifice you've made for me. I see the payment that's been made. And I'm overwhelmed by your love for me and how you could do such for me. I receive your gift of salvation. Immediately He puts His seal upon us. Immediately He puts the Holy Spirit within us. Immediately He lets it be known, this is now mine. Uh, this now belongs to me. Brian Wilson is no longer the devil's property. He is now God's property. And He stamps His seal upon me and He puts that Holy Spirit within me to be a reminder to me of, of what He has done for me. Not only is it a proof of ownership, it also speaks of security and protection. I'm His. <clears throat> and because I belong to Him, He's going to watch over me. <clears throat> He's going to protect me. Just as you would your own possessions, those things that you purchase, you try to protect. Maybe you buy a warranty to try to protect it. Maybe you uh, go through some different things. You find a, a safe place to hide it. You find a safe place to, to store it, whatever it is. You try to protect those things that are yours. Uh, they are yours. That You protect those things. God has much higher security than what we do. He's, he puts a premium on what He purchases. Look with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And look with me at verse 62. The idea of that seal, that He has sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise, that same idea is used in other places in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 27, Christ has been crucified. He has been taken down off the cross and He has been now wrapped by Joseph and Nicodemus. He has been placed into that borrowed tomb. 
He's been laid and the stone has been rolled in front of that. And they have intentions of coming back later to take care of the, uh, the spices and such like that, that, those things that were part of the ceremonial uh, things they would do. But the high priests were a little afraid. The high priests believed the words of Christ more than his own disciples did. Because they remember, notice what they say in verse 62, now the next day. The day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days, I will rise again. They believed in the resurrection. They knew it was going to happen. They wanted to do all they could to stop it. Verse 64, Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last heir shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. We see here that idea of, 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 of making it sure, of, of setting a seal there. It was to put a security uh, in place so that nobody could come in and steal away the body. That's the same idea that Paul is using here in Ephesians chapter 1 when he talks about the seal of the Holy Spirit, a promise. Uh, he has put a protection about it uh, that uh, nobody can come in and take. Uh, unlike man who can put a security system in, but it is faulty because it is made by man, uh, this security system is put in place by God Almighty. And He will take care of what is His own, and He will not let anybody come in and steal it away. He reminds us in the book of Matthew in chapter 6 that uh, we can lay up things in this earth, but moth and rust uh, doth corrupt, and thieves do break through and steal. He says, but you lay up those things in heaven. He says, moth cannot touch it. Rust cannot corrupt it. And he says, thieves do not break through and steal. Now why? Because there is a security system in heaven's economy that is impossible uh, to be broken through. And what he's done for us in salvation is he's given us the Holy Spirit and he is our seal. Uh, he is our security, uh, if you will, uh, for that. Look with me at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. <coughs> In John 14, in verse 16, Jesus makes a promise to His disciples, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever, yes. even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth them not, neither knoweth Him. But ye know Him, for He dwelleth in you, or with you, and shall be in you. That Holy Spirit which uh, He gave to us, Christ said, when I am gone, I'm going to send you a comforter and He's going to indwell you. Uh, he's going to be inside of you. He's going to go with you everywhere you go. He said, with me, you've got me right here and you think I'm all you need. He said, but I'm going to give you something even better than my physical presence and that is the comforter. That way you can go anywhere and everywhere and no matter where you go, that Holy Spirit of promise is with you and He's there to walk with you and He's there to be your protector. He's there to watch over you. Aren't you glad He has given us that seal of promise? But listen, there's something we've got to be careful of. There's something we must be careful. We can grieve that Holy Spirit of promise. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve Him. Oh, He's sensitive. He's very sensitive to the things that go on in our life, and, and we could easily uh, grieve Him. The Bible warns us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, not to quench Him, to put Him out, to, uh, to, to, to squelch the fire, if you will. But here's the thing, even if you grieve Him, or if you quench Him, here's a promise, He'll never leave you. He'll never leave you. Amen. If the Holy Spirit were to leave us, we would lose our salvation. We can't lose him. He's a promise. Uh, he is the seal. Uh, he's the protection that God gives to us. But he wants us to know that it is authentic that he has done. Uh, Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 9. He tells us this here, but ye are not in the flesh, 
but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If the Holy Spirit were to leave us, we would be without Christ. But he doesn't do that. He's not like a lot of people in our lives, is he? Who come and go. Who as long as you're doing what I want you to do, I'll stay with you. But as soon as you stop doing what I want you to do, I'm going to leave you high and dry. He's not that way. He's faithful. Uh, he stays with us. The Bible says He has been given to us. He is a seal. He's a seal for us so that we know we have a guarantee of our salvation. But not only is He a seal, go back with me to Ephesians 1 once again. <coughs> Not only are we sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise, but also notice this in verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. He uses that phrase, the earnest. The earnest. Many of us know what that is, don't we? We recognize that term. Not only are we, uh, we, we, are we, uh, we saved by faith and we are sealed by the promise of the Holy Spirit, but we are secured uh, by the indwelling of the Spirit. He is our earnest. He is not only the proof of our position in Christ, He is also the pledge of our possession in Christ. He not only confirms our faith, He also confirms our future. He not only guarantees our eternal security, He also guarantees our eternal satisfaction. Uh, that's who He is. Uh, he's there, yes, to guarantee some things there, but He's right here right now to remind us that we have a home in heaven. We have the promises of God that we get to live with. He is the earnest. He is the, if you will, the down payment we were in the process of moving from Connecticut to Trenton, Missouri. It's been, I guess, five and a half years ago now. And uh, we found ourselves in a very unique position. Uh, one was this here. We were trying to sell our, our condo and also we were trying to buy a house from afar. Unlike our situation moving here, we did not have a place to land in case things did not go well. We had to have a house. And so I remember we flew out there in August and we looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and there was nothing. I know, surprise, surprise. We found nothing. <coughs> our friends up there, some of you have met the Millers. Uh, our friends, the Millers, they would uh, call us up and they would tell us about different things to look at. And there was a couple that we finally kind of settled in on like maybe one of these is going to be the ones that we want. And so they uh, graciously went to those houses and they... FaceTimed the houses. That is not the best way to go and look at a house. But it's what we had. And so they would walk from room to room and they would have their phone up and, well, this is this bedroom here and here's, the, here's this. And, and they went through the entire house and walked around outside and, and did their best to show us everything. And I remember we got off the phone and I said, well, what do you think? She's like, I don't know. <laughs> that just surprised me to death. <clears throat> she didn't know. I said, well, look, we got to figure something out because uh, we have nowhere to live right now. And so we need to figure something uh, here pretty fast. Well, eventually we settled in on 1705 East uh, 4th Street there in Trenton, Missouri, a nice little house that we were able to get. And so we called up the realtor. We told them what we were willing to give. They didn't like the price that we were willing to give. And so we went back and forth a few times until we finally settled in on a certain number that this is what we will pay for the house. And they were okay with it. And then the realtor made a statement to me. <clears throat> he said, okay, Mr. Wilson. He said, uh, uh, we'll get all the paperwork sent over and you can just uh, uh, sign it and fax it back to us. But I need this from you. I need some earnest money. I said, well, how much do you need? He said, I need $1,000. I said, okay. So I went to my checkbook and I wrote out $1,000 and I put it in the mail and sent it uh, their uh, uh, priority mail and it got there to them a couple days later and they took that money and they held on to that money. What was the purpose of that earnest money? The purpose was to show we were serious. Now, if we were to back out of that thing and go in there and say, oh, we changed our mind. We found something else. We want to go somewhere else. We could do that, but in so doing, we would lose our $1,000. Now, $1,000 may not be much to you, but it was a big deal to us. 
And so we, I said, are you sure? She's like, I'm sure. I said, are you really sure? She's like, I'm really sure. Okay, it's going in the mail. Once it's in the mail, sorry, no change in your mind now. We sent it off. And we ended up purchasing the house. We did not lose that money, but we would have lost it had we backed out. God has given you the Holy Spirit. Think about this. That Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us here in verse 14, is the earnest. If God were to back out on salvation, you know who he would lose? It's impossible. He can't lose the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God himself. They are three in one, yet one in three. How in the world does that work? Don't ask me to explain it to you. All I know is that's what the Bible tells me, and I will believe the Bible for what it tells me. And so he has given you the Holy Spirit. By giving you the Holy Spirit, you know what he is saying? He said, I'm in this thing, lock, stock, and barrel, and I am not backing out. No way, no how. He's given us the earnest of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 that He has begun a good work in us and He will perform it yeah. until the day of salvation. He's in this thing and He's made a promise to us. Listen, we can walk out of this room here this morning knowing that we are secure in Christ. We know that we have salvation and there is nothing that I can do to ever lose that wonderful gift of salvation. He's with us until that work is completed. Until, notice there he says in verse 14, until the redemption of the purchased possession. You're not looking at the end product. I like the little song our kids sing. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, Jupiter and Mars. Oh, how loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. He's not done with this here. He's still working me over. He's still trying to refine me. He's still trying to make me what I need to be. And that day whenever he is satisfied and he says, you're what I'm after. You're finally where I want you to be at. He then will take me home to heaven Amen. until that redemption work is complete in me. This is in reference to the redemption of the, of the body at the return of Jesus Christ, according to 1 John 3, 1 through 3, where the Bible tells that when we see him, we shall be like him. Aren't you looking forward to that day? No more sorrow, no more pain, no more sickness. Hallelujah for that. We'll be in his presence and we'll be just like him. He's working on us. He's preparing us uh, to, get, uh, to pre get us ready for that day. And then the day will come and the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that there will be a trumpet and at that trumpet, that those graves will burst open and the, the dead in Christ shall rise first. He's going to bring those home with him. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him uh, in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says that incorruptible must put on, uh, I'm sorry, that corruptible must put on incorruption. Uh, he's going to take it all. One preacher said it this way, that God wasn't going to let the devil have a single ounce of victory. He was taking everything with him, body, soul, spirit. It's all his. He's taken it all up uh, with him. He had purchased it all, and he intends to bring it all home with him. Yeah. Redemption shows up in three areas in our life. We've been redeemed through faith in Christ. Notice there again in verse 7, in whom we have redemption through the blood, through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. He redeemed us. He purchased us through that faith in Jesus Christ. We are being redeemed as the Spirit works in our lives to make us more like Christ. In Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, we find that, that, uh, that teaching of sanctification right now. He's working on us, uh, making us more like Christ day in and day out. And we're being redeemed in that way. He is working on us. And one day, one day soon, we shall be redeemed when Christ returns 
and we become like him. Uh, he's working on us. He has prepared us and he's given us the Holy Spirit to remind us that even though sometimes we may feel lost, sometimes we may feel like, where is God? Sometimes we may wonder, is God done working on me? Is God done using me? Can I tell you, the Holy Spirit is there to whisper in your ear to remind you, I'm not through with you yet, son. I'm not through with you yet, daughter. I'm still working on you. I'm still here. Oh, things might be quiet right now, but it doesn't mean I haven't quit working. And that Holy Spirit is there to constantly remind us and re reaffirm us that we are in Christ Jesus. We are in His hand. We are in the Father's hand. And no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. And ultimately, what is it all for? It's all for His glory. Notice there again in verse 14, unto the praise of His glory. The Holy Spirit has been given to us so that we would bring praise to Him. In many churches today, they have taken the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and they have turned it into something that brings praise to themselves. They have turned it to bring something that they become the star of the show. They become the one that all attention is placed upon. If the attention is being placed upon you, that is not of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has one thing and one thing only He wants to do, and that is He wants to point to Christ. That's all He does, is He just points to Christ, always pointing to Him. He's always wanting us to be more like Him. He's always wanting us to give Him praise. He's always wanting us to give Him glory. And He's always pointing to Christ. He's never pointing to us. He's never there to, uh, if you will, to, uh, to stroke our ego. No, He's trying to get us to die to our ego. He's trying to get us to die to ourselves. Why? So that we can be more like Jesus Christ. You've been given a wonderful gift. You've been given the Holy Spirit. This morning, I ask you, do you know the power of the Holy Spirit in your own life? You've been sealed. You've been secured by Him. He's been given to you to give you the assurance that, yes, you belong to God. Maybe this morning, you don't have that assurance. Maybe this morning you're walking along and you're not sure about where you will spend eternity. Can I tell you, if you have the Holy Spirit living within you, He will tell you that you're on your way to heaven. He's the one who gives assurance according to Romans chapter 8. He tells us. But if you don't hear anything, if you don't know that you're on your way to heaven, there's no assurance in your heart, one of two things has happened. Number one, You've been sold a bill of goods and you're not saved. Oh, you've got all the trappings. You've got the look. You know the things to say. But something's missing. And you know it. It's the Holy Spirit. Maybe this morning you need to come and receive Christ as your Savior and have that Holy Spirit, that gift of the Holy Spirit given to you to let you know and remind you that you're on your way to heaven, that you belong to God. Maybe this morning you need to come and get saved. I understand there were some this last Sunday that received Christ and got their, their salvation uh, nailed down. And boy, I'm, we're thankful for that. We praise the Lord uh, for that assurance that they have now to hold on to and know they've got the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Don't you want to have that same assurance, friend? But maybe this morning you say, Pastor, I know I received Christ. I know I got saved, but something's missing. Then maybe you have quenched. You've quenched the Holy Spirit. You've grieved Him. He has not left you. No, He doesn't do that. He stays with us always. But He can get real quiet. As I let sin dominate in my life, and I let sin come into my life, and I begin to give myself to those things my flesh would rather have, suddenly the voice of the Holy Spirit becomes very, very quiet. And maybe this morning there needs to be some confessing going on. Maybe this morning there needs to be some getting right with the Lord today. Maybe there's some uh, getting right so I can once again hear that beautiful, wonderful voice of the Holy Spirit who's there to guide me and to teach me and to help me along this Christian life. Listen, friend, you can't live this Christian life without the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. We must walk in the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit He's talking about. And we must have Him. We must have His assistance and His help. My friend, this morning, can I ask you, are you right? 
with the Lord today. Are you right with the Lord? He's given us a wonderful gift called the Holy Spirit. As we walk in the Spirit, we're able to experience and understand the wonderful blessings of salvation. We, I've, I feel like we probably have only scratched the surface of all that God's done for us. All that God wants us to know, all that God wants us to experience by being His child, oh friend, won't you come and either get saved this morning or get right with God so He can walk in the fullness of the Spirit. Father, help us today.